thought about this topic for, you know, well, this past week, leading into the Sabbath. I thought, well, I did make mention a couple months ago that maybe I'd do a few sermons based on moral focus virtues. And I think the past couple weeks we hit the gratitude one pretty well. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, with all that's going on in the world, with you know, patience being, I don't know how you say, wearing thin, <laughs> patience can wear thin. We see things on the news, we're moved to emotions whether it's the prayer list, or as I mentioned, the news, uh, what we read, what we see, um, you know, as, as teachers, as uh, you know, teachers, we see what happened in Oxford, Michigan. Those kind of things, just, it, it, you, you know, you get all these emotions in you And I just thought, you know what? As God's people, self-control is a big part of who we should be and how we should how we should be towards not only each other but to the world. As I've made many mention, I made many times I have mentioned that as a teacher in the building in the school that I work in, ever since I've been there for 19 years. Speaking of time flying, doesn't seem like that should be 19 years. It doesn't at all. Each month we demonstrate and we talk about and we teach the students, no matter what grade level, all the grade levels, a moral focus virtue. And December's is self-control. How we say it at our school as an overall arching theme is self-control is to demonstrate the ability to regulate emotions, desires, actions, and reactions. That's our overall theme across um, our K through eight building. We do break that down. We do break that down by grade level too. We go in more detail by grade level. Our eighth grade one is display appropriate restraint for any given situation, even those out of your control. I also have a couple others here that I looked up, the seventh grade and the sixth grade one, So, because we're, we're supposed to build on these as we go each year. And uh, So the sixth grade one is take the time to choose an appropriate response. So that's where patient comes, patience comes in. Take the time to choose. We've talked about choice before as well. We've talked about choice in previous messages. We have the power to choose, but once we make that choice, we don't have the power to control that consequence, whatever that consequence is, either positive or negative. Then also the, um, I believe that was the sixth grade one, sorry, if I said it wrong. The next one, the seventh grade one is, resist the temptation of immediate rewards. Work hard to earn recognition. I wanted to share some of those with you today. And we're going to go into God's inspired word to look at and to understand that these principles are in the Bible. And we'll look at scriptures to encourage us, to help us build on our self-control. Some of these I just look at and I look at you know the world around us. Especially the one that, you know, the eighth grade one, display appropriate restraint for any given situation, even those out of your control. We live in a time in a world that many things happening around us are out of our control. Out of our control as humans. And we need to be careful and be wise. And again, as that one earlier said, take the time to choose an appropriate response. In our ongoing fight to overcome, we must understand and put into practice self-control. It is a constant battle. It is a constant battle. Every day, day in, day out, we're being tempted. 
by our enemy. We're being tested to see where our heart lies, if we trust God. Many of us, I mean, in the past six months, 18 months, we've seen a lot of things happen. In the past two years, five years, for many years, we've seen things happen. So, you know, in the news, and it just seems lately it's coming to a head, and it probably is. It probably is coming to the head. I had a joke. I joked a little bit. Maybe you, I don't. You know, Josh was smiling at the very beginning of before services, and I said, we know we're in trouble when we get to the COVID variant named Omega. I, I, don't, I don't know if, I mean, I'm just saying that in passing, but all these variants and things happening and the reaction to the variants, we can only control what we can control. We can't worry about things out of our control. We have to do what we know is right. And Paul, again, Paul understood that. This internal battle happens each and every day. And there are days that are harder than others. Things that we face, things that pop up, things that we didn't think we would face. And now we got to face them. Whether it's, you know, whatever it is. Whatever it is. Romans 7. Just to reiterate what Paul says here in Romans 7. Romans 7, verse 14. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So he admits that I'm human. I'm, 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 I'm a man. I'm not spiritual. I'm carnal. We're all carnal. That's what we are. I've always said to, to, to people, if you, don't, if you don't believe that, pinch yourself. Does it hurt? Did you feel it? Well, you're, not, you're still carnal. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. See, he's talking to the church in Rome, the called out ones. Just as we are called out ones, and we have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Father in us. And it's a struggle. It's a struggle each day. We have to stay focused each day. Verse 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I will, that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. See, that spirit. We have the spirit. We know. We've been taught. We understand. We don't know what the law is. We know what God expects. We know all of that. We've been taught. We take it in. And that inward man that Paul talks about is the spirit. That new man, renewed day, day in and day out by the Holy Spirit. So we have this, you know, again, this struggle, this tug of war. When I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we have help. If we didn't have help, we wouldn't succeed. Let's just say that up front here. This is it's not going to be the end of the message. We'll say it right here. If we don't have help, if we don't ask for help, and we don't receive that help, and we're not open to that help, we will not succeed. And that's where part of self-control comes in. How do we display appropriate restraint for any given situation? How do we resist the temptation of immediate rewards? How do we tell ourselves to take the time to choose an appropriate response? 
If we don't have God through Jesus Christ, then those things will fall apart. And we won't have those things. And we will not be successful as we grow each and every day. message version of Romans 7. Verse 14. Well, actually, I want to I want to start in verse 13 of the message version. He says, I can already hear your next question. Does that mean I can't even trust what is good? That is the law. Is good just as dangerous as evil? No, again. Sin simply did what sin is so famous for doing using the good as a cover to tempt me to do what would finally destroy me. By hiding within God's good commandment, sin did far more mischief than it could have ever accomplished on its own. So sin can hide. Our enemy can hide sin so it can tempt us and say, oh, maybe I want to go down this road. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all of God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself, after all. I spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then to do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law, but still can't keep it, and the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covetly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. So as we strive to build on our self-control, we know, and Paul tells us, and we've learned it throughout the years, we need our Father through Jesus Christ. We need both of them to help us. 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians 9, verse 24. We've read this scripture several times in the past, but again, it bears to be read today. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. So we have to be temperate when we run this race before us. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. We go back to verse 25 and it says, is temperate in all things. The translation is also exercises self-control. That word temperate, temperate can also mean to exercise self-control. 
in verse 27, and again, he says, I discipline my body. We've got to discipline our body, our minds, our spiritual um, selves to practice the self-control. That's what Paul talks about. We have to discipline. And how do we do that? Through Christ. We discipline. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. Let's go to 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. Timothy 1, let's see, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So he's called us. He's given us this spirit to help us to be of sound mind. I just want to read in a different version. I'm not saying it's going to be the message version, but... In the NIV... It reads, verse 7, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Self-discipline. We use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's given to us power, love, and self-discipline. So then it says, don't be ashamed. Again, repeats what I said in the New King James Version. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me as prisoner. Rather, join me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. He sees something in us. So we have to have that self-control, work on that self-control. Be better to say no thank you to the temptations that we may face, the things, the, the hidden sins that can so easily ensnare us. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. I was inspired to write here, Proverbs 25. Verse 28 says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. If we don't have self-control, if we can't control ourselves, we might as well be like a city that has the walls are down and it can be ransacked easily by the outside. Coming in, you know, let's use the example of Jericho. When God brought the walls down, it was so much easier for the nation of Israel, the, the, the children of Israel, to overtake Jericho, right? This is kind of common sense. So if we have no self-control, we have no self-discipline, it is like a city broken down without walls. We'll just let anything into our minds and our bodies and our hearts and our souls. We don't want to be that way. That's not what we're called to be. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, verse 32. It says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. self-discipline again in God's eyes that's honored more than the mighty it's honored more than somebody who can overtake a city we have self-discipline we rule our, ourselves the way that 
is holy before God. So to Second Peter. Second Peter verse one. I mean excuse me, Second Peter chapter one. We've read this several times. It's part of who we are supposed to be, self-control, self-discipline. Second Peter, ver, uh, I keep saying verse, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence. So we've had, we've had that discussion before. What does diligence mean? It means you keep going, you, you keep going through. Diligence means you keep working, working hard. Add to your faith virtue. Okay, virtue. Doing the right thing, having good virtues. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. Now that we have the knowledge, we've grown, we get, we, not that we're done obtaining knowledge from God. We learn, we should be learning things every day, every week, every Sabbath. We come in. If we don't learn something new, maybe reminded of something that we forgot. This knowledge that we have, now we add self-control. Are we able to keep the course? Are we able to keep our walls up and not allow our enemy to come in and take away or twist or change our minds, say, well, you know what, something else looks better. We're working on that self-control, and when we it says to self-control, perseverance. And we've talked about perseverance. That's patience. That's patience. As made mention earlier, take the time to choose appropriate responses. That's patience. If we don't take the time and we don't aren't patient. We might more than likely, as humans, our track record and in in our history tells us that we probably will not make a good choice, a good decision. And to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. It says in verse 8, for if these things, all these things, including self-control, are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if he lacks these things, again, there's several things there, but today we're talking about self-control as the topic, which self-control is one of them. For if he lacks these things, he's short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And we could keep reading, you know, because it says, be more diligent to make your call and election sure. Self-control. Galatians 5. Galatians 5, another very familiar scripture, but the one that is appropriate for today and to be reminded of, Galatians 5. Verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Self-control. Personal discipline using the Holy Spirit that we've been given. Self-control. Again, we can't do it on our own. Paul made that very clear. And I agree with Paul. We need God. We need our Savior, Jesus Christ. These are the fruits of the Spirit. And if we struggle with these, we need to come before our Father, before the throne, as it says in Hebrews, boldly, and ask for help and guidance. 
I always think when I read that scripture, I always think of the song that I heard, you know, at the feast, and the fruit of the spirit song that you've, oh, it's hilarious. I love it. I love that song. Should have, should have found her. Have you sing it? I don't know. You could play it for me. I should, I should have asked you that. I just love that little song. The kids, the, the, well, I, I mean, I say kids, but some of them are teenagers now and man, they're growing up. The Sabbath class, I just don't mean to get off, off topic. It just makes me think of the little ones, but a lot of them are not little ones anymore. So, no. Proverbs 18. Just, uh, sorry, I was kind of off topic about that. It just makes me think. You read Scripture and you think of different things. And good things, happy things. And I just happen to, you know, when you read that Scripture, you think of the Sabbath school classes and the songs that they find and sing. I am trying to get to Proverbs 18. I would like you to join. I'm trying to get to I'm, in, I'm like, why am I in Kings and Chronicles? Proverbs 18. Oh, my. Oh, my. Proverbs 18, verse 21. It says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Self-control. How are we going to say things? How do we approach uh, people, items, um, situations? Self-control. What that's saying is, if we allow it and we don't have self-control, our mouth can get us into trouble. We have self-control and we say things, we say them pleasantly, we say them in a way that you know, still the truth, but we say them in a way that we don't get ourselves into trouble. <laughs> and we still get across what we need to get across. Self-control. And we will, you know, eat its fruit, whatever fruit that is, good fruit, bad fruit, however that goes, we will deal with the consequence whether we have self-control or not self-control, dealing with different situations. James chapter 1. Speaking of patience, James chapter 1. Verse 19. It says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So even James says, hey, you be patient. We have that self-control. I think we can all agree that human nature, carnal nature, we'd rather be the opposite of those things. Well, maybe we'll be still be swift to hear. But carnally, we like, well, we're going to run our mouth. Carnally, we want to rise up quickly and have a little bit of wrath on somebody. But as he says in verse 20, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It produces the opposite. In the NIV, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Self-control. As we face different things. And we want, I mean, again, as I said at the beginning, we see all these things happening. And we, maybe we do get riled up. And we should pray. We should pray. You know, for God to help us understand, to find the peace that we need. Again, what's the definition back there I put up there? Appropriate restraint for any given situation. 
even those out of our control. If we can't control it, then part of that is we got to learn to let that go. We will be tempted. 1 Corinthians 10, we will be tempted. There's no doubt about that. Again, we've said that many times, and we, but we need to take that to heart. And I do believe as we get closer and closer to the, whatever, the end of our lives, or the end of this age, whatever the case may be, and we're still overcoming, our enemies are going to come after us like, no, you know, as they say, nobody's business. You know, he's coming. We will be tempted. And perhaps, just like Job, God will allow the hedge to be shrunk. It could be. To see where our hearts lie. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 but Paul writes here, says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful. So then again, there's the common denominator. There's God. God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. So that, that, you know what that tells me? God has faith in us. God cheerleads us. He makes a promise that you will not, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I take that to be a true promise from our Father in heaven. But we have to overcome it. We have to get out of the temptation. It's not like, well, okay, God's allowing us. Don't read that wrong. Don't be twisted. Don't let words be twisted. God knows us better than he knows our, we know ourselves. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And we will be tempted. But will we use the tools, his tools, will we rely on him to increase our self-control and our self-discipline and recognize that temptation? Let's look back at that def another definition I mentioned earlier. Resist the temptation of immediate reward. Whew, look at our world today. Internet, TV, whatever. The internet, I mean, the internet, just easy. Immediate reward. Immediate instant gratification. So many different things. Instant gratification. Oh, you know, and even if it leads to, if, when, if things like that lead to sin, there's many things on the internet that can lead to sin. I'm not going to go any deeper than that. Just, you know, many different things on the internet that can lead to sinful attitudes, sinful behavior, immediate rewards, the promise of immediate rewards. Oh, you'll feel better. Oh, you know what? You put $10 down here, you might get 1000 Hey, come on. All these different things. What else did we say? You work hard to earn that recognition. You work hard. Not immediate rewards. Not the temptation of instant gratification. Because that's usually mm, not a good thing. Resist the temptation of immediate rewards. Instant gratification. We don't want to be heading down that way. But God does promise that there is a way out of it. Recognize it. Use self-control. Godly self-control. Pray about it. Don't listen to that voice of the carnal mind that says, Ah, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. No? No? It won't be. If we can stay away from willfully sinning, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. Proverbs 12, verse 16. 
And there's many other things to the internet, just the, the age that we live in. You know, on the internet, it's there at our fingertips. Many examples throughout history of instant gratification or instant re promises of instant reward. Proverbs 12, verse 16. A fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. A prudent person doesn't act quickly. A foolish person whose temper is uncontrolled will lead to things that are not good. What that says is covers a prudent man covers shame. What that means is a prudent man will not retaliate against an insult. Or something bad happening to them that would down the road would make that person shameful. I said, I, I spoke too fast. I didn't take the time. Right there, a fool's wrath is known at once. A fool reacts in, instantaneously. You know, okay, well, you know, there's his, his or her shame already, acting a fool. We strive to be prudent to overcome the afflictions that come our way. We strive to overcome the temptations that come our way. To be prudent, to be patient, to take a moment and pray and ask God to help in whatever form they may come in. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's self-control. That takes self-control. We are told to renounce and deny and not listen to the worldly promises and worldly desires and to strive with all of our heart and our very being to live holy lives, you know, godly lives, consecrated to, God, consecrated to God with all of our heart, mind, and body, our being in this present age. And I know... Paul was talking to Titus in that time. But even now, in this present age that we live in, to have that self-control. It's renouncing the worldly desires and the things that we came out of. I've said this many times. If God hadn't touched our minds, we wouldn't know what we didn't wouldn't know. We don't we wouldn't know what we should know and all that kind of stuff. We'd still be blinded. But we know better. We strive to be better. And we should. We do sin. No one's perfect. As I've, we've said many times, many speakers have said, only one human has ever been perfect. It's our Savior, Jesus Christ. We still sin, and it, and it hurts when we sin. Because why? Because we know better. Because it hits us in the head, upside the head, as, oh, we just sinned. We knew better. We had a way out. We didn't take the way out. We were tempted, and we fell. Which... However, as Paul says, and other, and others, not only Paul, but other apostles say, praise be to our Savior Jesus Christ that we can come before the throne and ask for forgiveness and guidance. But that's why it hurts so much when we do make that mistake and we sin, whatever sin that is, because we knew better. We didn't show proper self-control. I wish you'd stand up. 
stand up. Titus 2, we just read that, Titus 2, 11 through 12. We stand tall and say no to ungodliness. Say no to that ungodliness. Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We talked about that in the past few months. What's the will of God? Micah says, walk humbly with God is His will. His will also is that you pray always, rejoice always, pray without ceasing before Him. We've proven that through Scripture, what His will is. As I made mention, the world can promise rewards and quick fixes. Things that are too good to be true, and as they say, usually they are. Because they are usually false promises, and in the end they fall apart. Lead us down a path we didn't want to go down. We have to keep working and building on our self-control to take in and to understand the will of God, which we just mentioned and we t we've talked about. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 11. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Again, going back to what we said earlier about taking time, being patient. You know, we just run, you know, just explode, as they say, when something happens. We usually make a fool of ourselves. We may say something or do something that we can't take back. Can we have emotions? Yes, we can have emotions. God has emotions father does christ on this earth had emotions it even says in ephesians 4 4 26 paul says you can be angry at something just don't sin it takes self-control to do that i mean i don't have to be happy with what's going on in the world i didn't say that scripture doesn't say that we can be angry with sin But where's the self-control? Because sometimes, as I said, we may mention in the uh, prayer list, you know, what's happening in Australia. If somebody makes a choice, overreach, and that's not that's not part of. The, I mean, that's not the sermon. But I'm saying, as God's people, we can be angry. We can our emotion. We have emotions. Ephesians 4, verse 26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. That self-control, that balance. We can be angry at what's going on, but we have to be respectful as well. It's the whole thing with a person that sins, and you know we know somebody that sins, lives a life that shouldn't be living. We can be angry with the sin, but we can't hate the person. How far does that go? There's the self-control that we don't take it out on the person. We pray for them. Maybe we can offer... I mean, they may, may say, no, thank you. They may get angry about it. Can I help you? Can I help you with something? Well, no, I don't want your help, okay? We can have emotions. But it's got to be in control of our emotions. Take a moment to think. Take a moment to pray. In our case, I know the definitions that I say don't bring in prayer, but in our case, we take a moment to pray about it. We take several moments to pray about it.
It says take time to choose an appropriate response. Take time to pray. <clears throat> yes, I'm not happy with this, and now I'm yes, I'm angry about that. I don't like how this is going. Okay, take a moment. Or several moments. Or days or whatever it is to pray and work it out. Job 31, verse 1. Job 31. He says, I have made a, this is Job 31, verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? And in the different versions that you can read, what he's saying is, I made a covenant to make the right choice. I made a covenant inside of me to make the right choice. And so I'm not going to lust, basically, I'm not going to lust after this young woman that I see. So what, you know, this is saying is, we made a covenant with God through His commandments that no matter what we see or hear or feel, we will not lust. We will not break those commandments. We will not do the things. The NIV version says that, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. We made a covenant not to continue, not to not continue in sin, to strive to overcome, to have that self-control that I'm not going to look at this situation. We can look at all the commandments, the Ten Commandments. Not to lust, not to lie, you know, not to murder. To not put things above God. It's about self-control. Proverbs 4, verse 27. It says, Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. Talking about the path that we are on. Having a self-control when we're tempted to leave that path. to stay on it and keep striving to overcome. Our fight is spiritual as we come. we got a few more scriptures, but we're getting close to the end here. Our fight is spiritual. We know this. We've talked about it. And I don't dismiss, you know, we've heard it, but do we, do we, every time we hear it, do we take it in? Ephesians 6. Many of us, as soon as I said Ephesians 6, oh, I know where he's going. Yes, Ephesians 6. I'm saying. <laughs> no, the topic of Ephesians 6. The armor of God. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Ephesians 6, verse 12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our fight is spiritual. But we face physical things that can trip us up. Our enemy knows where he can come after us. Where, how, why. He knows. We have to build upon our self-control and trust the promises of God. Second John. Second John. Let's see. Only has one chapter in Second John. Verse eight. There we go. Second John. It's only one chapter in Second John. Verse eight. It says, Look to yourselves. 
that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Is that where this d definition comes from? Work hard to earn recognition. Not mankind's recognition. God's. Do not lose the things that we worked for. Look at ourselves. We do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward from our Father in heaven. First Corinthians seven. Back to First Corinthians, chapter seven, verse five. First Corinthians seven verse five says, "Do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time, that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control." Where is our self-control? Is it like that city, the wall has been broken down and every enemy, every animal, wild animal can come into the city and ransack it and take it? Or is our self-control like the city that has walls that are high and new? You know, I think, you know, when Nehemiah, they were rebuilding the wall and they had the swords ready. Wonderful sermon message by Josh. I don't know, a year ago, a couple years ago, about Nehemiah and had the sword. Maybe it was this year. The sword's ready. They're building the wall. They cared about the city. They wanted to build the wall. The wall was down. They're building it, protecting the holes in the wall with their swords in one hand. It makes me think of that. Lack of self control will invite temptation. The lack of self-control will invite temptation, which leads to sin. Well, let's go back to Ephesians 6. We were just there a few minutes ago. Ephesians 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Praying always. Take a moment and pray. Be patient. Don't let the carnal nature win. Don't let carnality win. Paul said it when we read it at the beginning of that struggle. We're still human. But we do have the Spirit of God in us. And he's made a promise that there is a way out of temptations. There's a way to use self-control to better ourselves. <coughs> but we pray always. With all prayer and supplication. Relying on Him. Let's go to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. We trust in Him. We have to trust in God. We have to trust in His promises. We have to trust in Jesus Christ. Or as we, or I could have stopped five minutes into this message and just said, oh, good, we're done. Paul talks about it. We can't do it by ourselves. We've been called to a wonderful calling. But part of that is if we want to continue and we want to grow, we've got to show that self-control. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 through 9. It says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes but its leaf will be green and will not, 
and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? it? Says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. You know, I just, I read verse 8. And I think of our, our time here, right now, 2021, almost 2022, as man counts the years. We'll not fear when he, the heat comes. When heat comes, we'll not fear. We'll not fear when things happen that could, ca could cause our destruction. That could cause pain. Not going to fear that. But its leaf will be green. We'll, we can still be green. We can still produce. And we'll not be anxious in the year of drought when things are low. We can't get the thing. Maybe we can't get the things that we need. Or is it the things that we want? I truly believe God provides every need that we that we, we we will have. He has and he will continue to do that. Sometimes part of self-control is understanding needs versus wants. Nor will cease from yielding fruit. The man who trusts in in the Lord and whose hope is the, in the Lord will not cease from yielding fruit. Even though it will seem tough, it's unbelievable. You know, as a science teacher, I read that, you know, it's like, yep, you know, plants in the drought, plants will die because they don't get water. Things will happen to an ecosystem if there's a drought. But whose hope is in the Lord? Us ourselves being, you know, will continue to yield fruit by God's mighty hand. One last scripture, Exodus 15, 2. One last scripture, Exodus 15, verse 2. And this is them celebrating their deliverance. They're coming out of Egypt. God, you know, taking care of them, the Lord God. Just this one verse, Exodus 15, verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. We started today with a few definitions. Demonstrate the ability to regulate emotions, desires, actions, and reactions as self-control. Also, part of that is take the time to choose an appropriate response. Resist the temptation of immediate rewards. Work hard to earn recognition. And display appropriate restraint for any given situation, even those out of your control. I so badly wanted to say it right there at the very beginning of the sermon. It is out of our control, but it's not out of God's control. That's the connecting piece. God is in control of all things. He sees all things and he knows all things. And he's let us know many, many wonderful things through his inspired word. And one of those things, as we read here in the last couple of scriptures, is a trust in him. Give it over to him. Because he is in control. He controls all things. And we give it over to him. And it's part of self-control to be humble enough to give it over to him. Say, God, I, can't, I have nothing to do with this. It could affect me. It might affect me. It affects our brothers and sisters. Father, you're in control. Please take it. And through that heartfelt prayer, and through studying the Word, we can, we'll increase our self-control. We'll give it over to God. Have Him control it. May God continue to guide us, help us, and strengthen us as we continue the path to the kingdom.